Driven. Hello, everyone. This is Data Driven Chat, and today I'm so excited because we have Paul Wixi with us. Hi, Paul. Hello. Paul is an internet pioneer. He's also a chairman and CEO of uh, Farsight uh, Security Incorporated. So we will talk a lot about um, all the kind of all all the things that uh, Paul did in his career. And um, well, basically, to me, he's one of the founding fathers of internet. I don't know if that's a good description. You'll probably disagree with me, but uh, that's. Uh, um, how you know my students think about you anyway? So, like I said, I uh, we will talk about uh, some of the work that you've done. So, I'm, I'm really, really excited to have you with us today. Thank you for finding the time, Paul. I am very glad to be here. I do want to point out the internet was invented by various people, including Vint Cerf, and they first got it going in 1969, 1970 or so, when I was six years old. So, I am a latecomer. Right, but you know, we will talk about the you know your contribution to it. So, um, yeah, I just want to start with you and your personal journey into computer science. So, can you tell us, um, you know, how did it start? When did you realize that you wanted to be a computer scientist? Well, I don't think I knew that word at the time, but I mm -hmm. uh, I was exposed to computers, which were primitive even by that day, uh, by that day standards. Uh, in my junior high school. So uh, I'm going to say 1976, 77. Um, so we had some teletype Model 33s in the math lab. They were connected by modem to an HP mini computer at a, at a high school. And uh, it was, when I saw it, the most fascinating thing I had ever seen in my life. Um, and uh, so I spent all of my time doing that. Eventually, uh, started spending my time at that high school and becoming a volunteer and then a, a paid lab aide there. So it just uh, came out of the blue. I was exposed to it through the public school system, and uh, it turned out to be an addiction. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of go back to 1980s, if you will, and. Uh... Uh, yeah, so talk about the uh, Berkeley Internet name domain, so uh, BIND, uh, or BIND, I don't know what, what is the correct way of pronouncing it, you will tell me, uh, that was developed at Berkeley. So you were one of the people kind of looking after it in, uh, initially, right? And that's uh, what helped us develop the DNS, the domain name um, space. And you were, as far as I understand, one of the initial developers of this whole idea, and uh, you looked after it, is that correct? <laughs> um, again, not so. I was uh, a little bit too young to have been involved in those mm -hmm. very early days around 1983 mm -hmm. when uh, prototypes started to appear. And um, I, I am good friends now with the inventor of DNS. His name is Paul Macapetris. Uh, he's also a, an investor in my company and a member of my board, so I'm very lucky uh, to have made that, that acquaintance. But um, First, it's important when you understand DNS history that uh, it was experimental in the early 80s and then was completely revised for the late 80s, uh, basically by doubling all of the container sizes, field sizes, that sort of thing, to uh, make sure it was not too constrained over time. Um, the earliest implementation was for a DEC-10, uh, DEC-10 system. Mm -hmm. And I think that was called Jeeves, and then there was another one called Chives. Chives, mm -hmm. uh, And um, what happened was the U.S. government decided that this uh, ARPANET, as it was then called, uh, was a pretty good thing, and they wanted all of their contractors to have access to it so that they could share information and email and everything else. Um, and so they, they looked at this DEC-10 and said, that's a very expensive computer, we need to do something else. So they funded the Berkeley distribution of Unix, uh, first for the PDP-11, mm -hmm. also a DEC product, uh, but much cheaper, uh, more of a mini computer, less of a mainframe. And then they funded uh, further development to port all of this onto the DEC VAX, which was a 32-bit system. And it was in that last transition uh, from the PDP-11 to the VAX that somebody finally said, you know, we need a name server that runs on Unix. We can't just depend on having a DEC-10 somewhere to handle that for us. 
and that is what caused the U.S. government to fund the development of uh, what is now called BIND, Berkeley Internet Name Demon, or domain, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and that started out, you know, very humble origins. It was just a simple C program doing the best it could. Uh, C has a lot of weaknesses in terms of both program safety and uh, correctness, uh, assurance, or provability. Uh, so it's it's kind of a wild west programming language where you can do you can do whatever you can get away with. Uh, so the, the early versions were extremely weak and um, kind of too sciency. So uh, when I got involved was 1988. Mm -hmm. I went to work for DEC, who had made the DEC 10, the PDP 11, and the VAX, and thus was. Uh, sort of uh, held in a place of high esteem by all of us who liked Berkeley Unix. So I went to work in their Western Research Lab in Palo Alto, California. And, um, you know, my my job there was to keep the Internet Gateway running. Um, mm -hmm. So did you realize back in the day that it, it will be so big, you know, that the, you know, Internet will be the, the next big thing? What was, what was it like back in the day? Um, um, I don't think we knew how big uh, mm -hmm. microelectronics was going to get. Uh, we didn't realize that uh, by being sort of the, 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 the most open system and the most uh, available system, that TCP IP would win kind of by default. Now, there was a telco-based system called OSI, so think of X.25, X.29, X.400, TP4, all of those technologies. Um, that was seen by the business community as the likely way that the world would do what is now called e-commerce. Um, but it was not generally available and it was uh, really hard. If you wanted to make a change to it, you couldn't just contribute it and see if it caught on. You had to go to a standards meeting and see if you could get people to vote for you. And so it just, it was too slow, uh, too slow to change. I don't know, the protocols were slow. And so it lost by default. And um, we didn't realize that was going to happen. During my years of digital, they spent billions, that's like million, but with a B, billions of dollars <laughs> developing uh, DECnet Phase 5, which was meant to handle the OSI protocol suite. And they, were, they had a very nice implementation of it, but it turned out they had no customers for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a huge waste of money and lost opportunity for DEC. But during those years, those of us who were working on TCP IP really felt that uh, if we didn't work very quickly and uh, make a lot of progress uh, soon, that we were going to be overtaken and replaced by OSI. We needn't have worried. Uh, OSI was never going to work. Uh, but we were worried. We were in a big hurry. And so everything we did was rushed. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so how did the uh, how did the uh, DNS um, yeah how how did you develop DNS why did you need a change um, from 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 BND into DNS? So the precursor to DNS was the hosts file. Hosts file, file. yeah, 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 yeah. Hosts.txt, mm -hmm. uh, and it was very slow to change, right? Because the only thing connected to the network at that time was mainframes. They were very expensive. But when we got many computers, it turned out that that file was changing several times a week, which was unthinkable. Uh, but that's what you get. If you make computers cheaper, you get more of them. Um, and eventually, it became necessary to fetch that file. Everybody who was connected to the network had to fetch that file by the FTP, the file transfer protocol. And... Uh, you know, we started out fetching it once a month, then once a week, then once a day, then twice a day. Uh, and it was it was crazy. But, you know, so you didn't want to get mail from somebody you couldn't answer because they were on a computer whose name was so new you didn't know it yet. And so, again, the U.S. government said, well, we're going to need some scale here. This has to be more fluid, more dynamic. Um, and so they, they had a bake-off. There were a couple of different competing proposals. Uh, one was to simply extend the host's file with its own protocol, so there would still be one central dictionary of all names on the internet, but at least you wouldn't have to fetch it as a file twice a day. Um, that proposal did not win uh, because it was seen as sort of too fragile to have a single central dictionary server for all the names. 
at DNS one, largely because it said, look, you can put a name server anywhere. Mm -hmm. And everybody who's using the DNS, anyone who wants to publish content on the DNS can just operate their own name server. And they just have to tell somebody else the name of that name server. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of new names will work. And uh, that was exactly what was called for. I, I want to point out that in those early days, the problem that we had was that we had a lot of uh, new mini computers coming onto the network. And uh, all we needed was to translate the name of some computer to the address of that computer. Uh, they didn't, the addresses didn't change all that often, but we understood, yeah, sometimes you have to renumber because you get a different network or you move. Um, but really, it was, it was all thought about in, in terms of translating a name to an address. Mm -hmm. and there's only one kind of address, the IP version 4. Uh, and that was the entire scope of work. But um, Maka Petras, when he uh, designed DNS, uh, realized, you know, this is, these are early days. We're going to have a big system. We're going to need to be able to find other things besides just addresses. And so he developed it as an extensible system where you could add new data types over the years. And of course, for IP version 6, it has its own address record. And that was a relatively straightforward change to DNS. We didn't have to rethink anything, just had to add one more data type. Um, and that is that flexibility is the other reason why DNS uh, probably will last our lifetimes, is that it, it, it does exactly what we needed to do, nothing more, but it does it well enough, and it is easy to change when you wanted to do more. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, it's, it has some weaknesses, no question, but um, those strengths will, I think, outshine any weakness that's found. You already, you already touched on it, um, um, so, but I wanted to ask you, if you wanted to explain DNS to, to a non-specialist, how would you go about it? I tend to think about it as a kind of telephone operator in the old days, you know, who used to connect people, but um, uh, I'm sure there are better ways of doing that. So in the early days of the internet, um, in the late days of the ARPANET, we did that. We said, hey, it's kind of like the the phone book you know mm -hmm. you got to be able to find somebody's phone number if you intend to call them this is just kind of like that uh, the problem that we have now is uh, current generation people have never seen a phone book uh, if they want to know where somebody is they look them up in their contacts or uh, something like that but it'll be some smartphone web thing that, that, that we're not still printing phone books and sending them all over uh, similarly, I, I have sometimes tried to use the, uh, the phrase uh, internet dial tone, uh, but the trouble is smartphones don't make a sound before you dial your number, so the word dial tone exactly. doesn't make sense to the current generation. So that's just not how I explain it anymore because there is no reference in the phone world for it. Uh, mm -hmm. All I say is, look, the, uh, the, the number by which a, a service is reached by clients like phones or laptops or whatever, that number is hard to remember. Um, and it won't have any special meaning. It won't be, you know, like an 800 number in the U.S. means it's nonprofit, whatever. It'll just be a completely random looking uh, uh, collection of, of numbers. And those numbers are getting longer and those numbers have to change. And sometimes there's more than one in case you want to try more than one because maybe they've got one server in Russia and another server in Europe, another server in the U.S., something like that. And none of that is going to work. And so we just came up with DNS so that we could have human understandable names as a way to reach something that the computers had to be able to understand for us to get our work done. And that's, that's how I boil it down for a non-technical audience today. I no longer say phone book because they probably don't know what that is. Yeah, I, I, I completely appreciate that because uh, so I have a four year old son who recently told me, Mom, why did you, why do you say hang up the phone? Well, he can't really hang it up anymore. <laughs> you, know, you realize how old you are when that happens. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I'm a big uh, fan of your book, uh, Send, Send Mail Theory and Practice, that you wrote back in the 1990s. And uh, I actually require all my PhD students uh, to read it because I think it's a great uh, 
yeah, it's it's it's, it's basically a, a, a great way of telling someone what it was like, you know, and how do you develop the first uh, email routing system and uh, what type of problems you uh, you are faced with. So I think anyone who is a developer should read that book. Um, and um, yeah, so in, in that book, basically, yeah, the, uh, there is a quote from, so there is Leonard uh, Lovstrand who wrote the, um, uh, the intro for the book, the foreword for the book. And um, uh, he said there that, well, you know, send, send mail can be scary and this book um, uh, takes away the fear. <laughs> so there is, a, I was just thinking about it and I was thinking about DNS and how a lot of people do not understand what DNS is. And it's probably, I mean, this is my hunch, I don't know whether I'm right there. My hunch is that it's because people do not um, really have a good connection between, uh, you know, what is DNS and a good application. So do you think we will actually get to... Um, um, yeah, uh, get, get to develop uh, application uh, applications of DNS, which everyone could relate to. So maybe in a few years, DNS will be just as um, as easy to understand as email, like send mail. Yeah, in this case. So I want to say there isn't a market trend in the direction of sort of um, making DNS more understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the way I explain its importance is. You know, it's bigger than it's ever been, and more content is, is being added to the DNS on a day-by-day -day basis than ever before, but people are seeing it less and less. In fact, we often don't even see a domain name, because um, what we're doing is we're using a web browser uh, of some kind, we're doing a search, we're finding what we want, we're clicking on it, uh, all without seeing anything except something we wanted to click on. You don't have to type in domain names. And most of the time, you're not seeing them. Like, yeah, you see it in the URL bar of your browser. Um, but you know, the way I try and explain that is that even though we're seeing them less, there are more of them. And the only way that search works is because all of these web search sites have domain names. And that's how they link to each other is by a domain name. And so if you're a web uh, content, if you're you know, authoring content for the web, you're going to be thinking about domain names, but if you're just a consumer and reading things on the web, you probably won't know what the domain was. We're even seeing that in a lot of modern email clients, you just see someone's name. And if you hit, hit reply, then your mail program is figuring out what address that's going to. So you may not even know if you're a four-year-old today, you may never know that there was an at sign in the email address because you're just not looking at that. That's, so that's, the, that's where the market's moving is toward more people understanding less in order to get their work done. Um, and that's certainly what you see Apple and Microsoft and uh, to some extent Google and Facebook are all driving toward that. They don't want to require any expertise in order to get your work done. Exactly, exactly. And uh, yeah, I guess, um, you know, it, it a little bit reminds me of uh, uh, you know, human anatomy in the sense we, we all use body parts, but very few people understand, you know, uh, how it works. And uh, DNS is similar in that regard, which is unfortunate because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure we will talk about it, um, in, you know, in, in this conversation. But, uh, you know, there is, uh, there is so much potential for business and for uh, even, you know, in, in terms of... Uh, uh, gaining some personal understanding that touches on everybody, uh, everybody's life that is related to DNS, and we just do not, you know, realize that, which is, I think, really a missed opportunity for for many people. Well, it is, but especially for uh, the technical members of your audience, um, there's a there's a great game being played here, which is uh, that the future will be controlled by the people who understood how things worked today. And um, so everyone is competing for creating the, the, the right business conditions for their success. And that means they are paving some roads and building some walls and doing what they can to drive an audience toward where they want the audience to be. So um, what this means for anyone who is even slightly technical, if you know any kind of programming language, including Excel spreadsheet macros, then it behooves you to get out there and understand a little more about how the web works, how the internet works, how the DNS works, 
because you won't really, there's going to come a time when you won't know what candidate to vote for in an election, or you won't know which product to buy, which is a way of using your dollar votes, uh, unless you understand what they want and what they're going to try and do, and which alternatives you will be foreclosing if you pick that path rather than another. So I, I really, I want to treat, and I want everyone uh, in the sound of my voice to treat, to treat the growing complexity and the, the growing sort of lack of average expertise, because we have more and more people trying to use this without understanding it. Uh, as that in, understanding level goes down, then our ability to withstand manipulation by market forces goes down with it. And so we should never lose track of where the internet comes from, where our food comes from, where our energy comes from. Uh, I'm not saying everybody needs to join your PhD program and, and uh, become an expert on it. I'm saying you can't be an informed member of society without at least spending a few hours a year reading about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's even bigger than that, right? Uh, uh, currently, we are, I don't know, when something doesn't work, we just throw it away. And I always try to explain uh, to my son and uh, to my students as well that, you know, you really can fix things, you know, and uh, we, we don't seem to, to, to seem to do a lot of it. And in fact, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, kind of new things that are being produced, uh, you know, techy things, they're even made uh, in a way that you cannot, you know, easily fix them anymore. So, yeah, you actually need to get like 3D printer to print a part because you cannot easily buy it. You can only buy it from certain suppliers. Yes. So, yeah, definitely we want to promote thinking and independence. Uh, so in that regard, uh, yeah, definitely uh, DNS is a good example of that. Let's talk about far side security. Can you tell us uh, what do you do? Like what what uh, what does far side security do? Um, I know you do a lot of things, but, <laughs> but if you had to pick something. So internet security is a big problem. In other mm -hmm. words, the internet was built for an unsecure community of scientists, engineers, government contractors. And so almost all of the fundamental protocols are designed for high trust. And now we're using them in a low trust environment where everyone on the, in the world can reach you with a, an internet packet, uh, but we're still using the same, you know, unsecure systems that we had in the 1980s. Um, and that means there's a giant market for security services. Uh, because whether you're connecting to the internet so that you can use it, whether you're uh, connected to the internet so that you can make your materials, your products, your services available, your catalog perhaps available to other people who will use the internet. Uh, no matter what that is, you've got trouble. You are out there in a hostile environment using uh, non-hardened tools. And um, so I looked at that, I've looked at that really twice now. Um, back in the 1990s, I saw that email was too easy to send because we, we, we had the maxim, Postel's maxim at that time was to be uh, liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you generate. And that uh, unfortunately is exactly what spammers needed, uh, needed us to do for their business conditions. And so I started the first internet reputation system. It was called MAPS, M-A-P-S, the Mail Abuse Prevention System. system yeah. Also mm -hmm. bam, spelled backwards, so we thought we were very clever. Um, and the idea was just to try to have it be that if someone was misusing their internet connection to send a lot of unwanted mail, that other people could discover that without first having to receive the mail themselves. Um, and this did not work. You may note today that uh, spam is still being sent, so I failed. Uh, but this was my attempt to come up with a sea change uh, to re-level the playing field and try to have it be that there was a structural defense to a structural weakness. Um, so again, that didn't work out. We're still getting spam. Um, but later on, maybe 10 years later, when I was in my own PhD program uh, at the Keio University in, in Japan, uh, I needed grist. You know, anybody who's working on a thesis has to write a lot of papers so that those can become chapters. 
And uh, so I, I had to stop and think and say, all right, uh, instead of just building more stuff and trying to change the world, what can I build that can also offer me a chapter for my thesis? And um, so I looked at the biggest security problems the world had at that time, uh, and it was a little different. Spam was no longer you know, public enemy number one. And uh, what we had instead was this, this uh, paucity of data. So if you wanted to start a security project of some kind, uh, you had to first start by figuring out how you were going to observe the internet so that you could learn how it was being used, so that you could detect failures and weaknesses and attacks in those uses, so that you could develop defenses for them. So the, uh, pretty much anyone who wanted to build a defense system uh, had to first build an observation system. And I thought, what if we had a common observation system? that uh, was cooperatively operated so that anyone could contribute to it in a way that they were, you know, their, their legal rights were, were kept uh, and anyone could participate by, by observing what was being shared uh, as long as they agreed to observe those rights. And you know, as part of that was, hey, don't use this to generate spam, uh, but if you want to use this to generate defense, we'll let you have access to or let you pay if you're a commercial entity. We'll, we'll, will get you access in whatever way makes sense to you uh, to this huge observation system so that you can start in immediately on innovation and not have to first begin by developing your own global network to observe how the internet's being used. That was the original concept. Um, and it is a chapter in my thesis. Um, and we've uh, outgrown the technology that I prototyped at that time. And that would have been around 2007, 2008. And uh, so we built that inside my nonprofit, which was the Internet Systems Consortium, uh, mm -hmm. where I was the founder and the CEO and the chairman. Uh, and it, I it probably worked. did the majority of work as well. <laughs> I mean, well, by that time, we had probably 40 employees. Oh, wow. Okay. Combined anymore. I'd hired other people who rewrote it and got all my code out of the system because, you know, code needs to die. It needs to to begin and then somehow end and i wanted to find a way to do that so we we hired a very good team and bind version 9 has none of my code in it and i'm very proud of that because you know code should live and die um but anyway the uh that first system the uh, i called it uh, the isc security uh group um is still what farsight does today but in 2013, we realized that we could not continue to grow that function, building this global network and making the data available to people who could do good with it, couldn't grow it without capital. We could not, in other words, keep it inside of a nonprofit. So I raised money for a new company called Farsight, and then we used some of that money to buy these assets, the customer list, the software, the database, the contracts, all of that, uh, from my nonprofit, and I, I left the nonprofit, and they're in very good hands now. They have an excellent management team. They're a mature company. It's probably very good for them that I left. Uh, but I left my nonprofit in July of 2013 to come to Farsight to make sure that this asset would be uh, properly tended and would, would get the relevance that it deserves. And we've grown almost by a factor of 10. Uh, in the size of the business, the number of customers, number of sensor operators, everything is about a factor of 10 bigger now than it was in 2013. And um, I know that that is only possible because we became commercial. And so uh, in a nutshell, you asked a simple question. I'm giving you a long uh, dog-eared answer. I apologize. But the answer is we're, we're in the observation business. And we have tools, we have databases, we have real-time feeds. We have things that you can use to build a defense. So if you have digital assets, you need to defend them. And I want to advise against paying someone who says, oh, yeah, I will keep you safe. Just pay me a monthly yeah. fee. You'll be safe. Trust me. No, mm -hmm. you should understand what your risks are. You should understand how you're defending against them and how you're prioritizing. So your defense is going against the, the worst risks that have the sort of you know, biggest potential to hurt you. Um, and in order to do that, you'll have to do maybe a tiny bit of programming or some integration. You'll have to get some services from different companies and 
put them all together into your defensive system and we feed that market. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem there, I mean, I don't know whether you would agree with me, is the, the fact that, you know, how businesses actually set up KPIs in cybersecurity. I mean, most of the time it's, oh, we purchased this new tool, you know, and, and like, like you said, it's, you know, very often people who say, oh, we offer you something that makes your systems 100% secure. And then, you know, two months down the line, well, my team very often gets invited, you know, like, oh, you know, can you look into this problem and this problem and this problem? And uh, then, you know, you're trying to explain to people that nothing is 100% secure. If someone is, you know, promising you that, then they're probably lying. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, there's very little understanding of this in, in, in I think, in, uh, in business community. So it's just, you know, always, so oh, let's just fix this bug. Let's just put, purchase this uh, tool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I really like how Farsight Security, I think you're really in, in, uh, in the business of explaining risk to people. What is risk? Because they need to understand that. Because I feel that very often, especially when we talk about cybersecurity, there is this... Um, uh, narrative of fear, right? Like, well, you're surrounded by threats and, uh, you know, but with this magic tool, you can avoid all of them. And you're saying basically, well, you know, risk is unavoidable, but you can manage it and you need to learn enough about risk. And, and that's, I think, to me, at least, uh, this is how you stand out uh in 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 your your way of uh yeah uh, educating customers and basically explaining to them why it is important to use dns um in various is, but i want to say it's a challenge because mm -hmm. of course of course but it's, it's a lot a lot more challenging to explain risk to people than to scare them right yeah well yeah um <laughs> yeah so Perhaps my favorite uh, science fiction author of all time is Robert Heinlein. And uh, he once had one of his characters say something that is uh, profound, which is that self-deception is the root of all evil. Absolutely. And so when you, when you have a cybersecurity buyer who is out there trying to you know, figure out, okay, what do I do? You know, what risks do I have? How do I manage those risks? How do I measure them and then measure the management to see if I bought the right thing. You know, they're, they're, they have a big problem. Um, mm -hmm. But what that problem actually boils down to is, uh, how do I make sure that my company is never named in the headlines of a news story? How do I fix it so that uh, whatever happens to us, it is not a big PR disaster? Because if that happens, then the CEO is going to get involved and he's not going to like that. She's not going to like that. Um, so what they're really trying to do is to avoid being fired. Um, and, you know, I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm just saying that ultimately a cybersecurity buyer is trying to protect, protect their company. But the way the company is going to measure that uh, is not in, not in their hands. And what the company is going to do if they measure it poorly and they say, hey, it isn't good enough, is they're going to find somebody else to be the cybersecurity buyer. Those are just the facts of life. So that means uh, somebody who's talking to security vendors is often kind of interested in being lied to. They want to believe, they want self-deception, they want you to tell them uh, some far-fetched story, like if you pay me a monthly fee, I'll keep you safe and you will never have to know how I did it. Uh, because what that means is, let's say this was for antivirus or some other endpoint detection tool. And there are some very good ones, uh, so I'm not going to put down all endpoint uh, uh, tools, but I will say they don't solve the entire problem. Uh, that is, you know, one thing out of many that you have to do is recognize that your, your endpoint vendor is probably underpowered for security, and you're going to need to have some other vendor to come in and also operate as part of the endpoint operating system. And, and so that's fine. But what it really means to a cybersecurity buyer is that uh, if something bad happens, if the company gets broken into, then um, all they have to do is say, look, I bought all of the reasonable and customary defenses. Um, look, I've checked every box. Here's the checklist I got from, you know, some analyst firm somewhere. They said, you need this, that, and the other thing. And look, I have it. So look, that wasn't enough, but you can't blame me because I did all the reasonable and customary things. Now, nowhere in that explanation is the company saying, 
do you understand how it all works and what the risks were? They don't, the company doesn't care about that. They care what the shareholders see. Um, and so nobody's asking that question. And that means that for Farsight, it is sometimes kind of a tough love sale where uh, somebody will come to us and, and say, well, you know, what's your pitch? And we'll say, well, our pitch is we can help you understand what's going on so mm -hmm. that you can make informed decisions about what to do. Um, and some of what's going on is you're being attacked. Some of those attacks are coming across your firewall or hitting your endpoints. Some of those attacks are not, right? If somebody's impersonating you out on the open internet, then that's two third parties from your point of view. You have no way to know that's happening, but Farsight can tell you. And so by just adding the power of observation and saying this should underlie your entire cyber defense strategy, and then on top of that, you can then figure out what you're going to do about the things you learn by, you know, through, through our services. That is often not what people want to hear. That's like telling somebody who's uh, maybe a little bit fat, you know, hey, you're going to have to exercise. Well, isn't there a pill I can take? Um, well, no, there isn't a pill you can take. You really have to change your lifestyle if you want to change your outcomes. And so that's a challenge for Farsight, but we are up to it. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, like all this sort of kind of corporate culture definitely uh, uh, contributes to, to, to the problem, like you said, um, but also um, I feel that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just that the, the whole narrative is, uh, in, you know, around the, the, the cybersecurity threats as such that, oh, there are multiple threats and, you, you know, it's very technical, and <laughs> very difficult to understand. So it's a little bit like COVID, uh, you know, uh, people just told, well, you have to wear a mask, you have to keep distance. But I don't think anyone explained to them what is the, you know, what is the probability of contracting COVID if you are, if you are doing that and if you're not doing that, right? So because it's difficult, so you, you get into probability abilities and that's not what people want to hear. I want to um, go to uh, kind of the topic of attribution because um, um, a lot of people who like myself work uh, in cybersecurity were very much interested in attribution, how to attribute uh, crimes to, you know, cyber criminals, cyber adversaries. And um, very often I think we, we just get to, I don't know, maybe um, Ma yeah, money mules, you know, wherever you can trace the money, uh, you can get to those people. But it's very, very, very difficult to get to the organizers of cybercrime. And um, um, when I first started to think about DNS, I thought, oh, you know, it's very much like the internet DNA. So and we had uh, recently this case when a sex offender was um, uh, identified using one of those uh, DNA banks because his relative went to a, a DNA bank and that's how, you know, the law enforcement kind of were able to catch him. So um, what potential, in, in your opinion, does DN DNS have in, in attributing cybercrime? Is that really, because uh, when, when I was uh, thinking about it, I thought, oh, wow, this is probably a great way of, you know, getting that attribution. Well, so it, it can be, it mm -hmm. can help, uh, but it really depends on sort of uh, respect for norms or even respect for uh, laws and regulations. So um, I am sometimes asked by, let's say somebody in Interpol, Europol, uh, whatever national uh, police system, uh, gee, can we possibly get you to tell us where a certain question came from? We know this domain name was hosting some child, uh, online child abuse materials and uh, we'd really like to know who looked it up because you know, there may be some researchers in law enforcement among the, lo the people looking it up, but there will also be some offenders. And uh, what I have to tell them is no, you know, we have mm -hmm. no records of who looked anything up. And um, you know, it doesn't mean that I like online child abuse materials. That means that I like knowing what's in the DNS. And so when we uh, go to a potential sensor operator, who might be a university or an ISP or a large hosting company, whatever, and we say, we would like to trade data with you in, in the following ways, I have to be able to assure them that there will not be attribution to their customers through our service. Otherwise, they mm -hmm. will not join because that's too much liability for them, especially in a world that has GDPR and the California CCPA mm -hmm. and all the rest of that, right? So the, anything that would allow you to build a profile on an internet user, 
you have to have consent for. And that's the way the world is trending. I think that's a good law, that's a good standard. We had been observing that long before GDPR. So GDPR was a non-event for my company, whereas a lot of American tech companies said, are you crazy? We'll go out of business if we observe those practices. Okay, great, go. But um, from our point of view, what we want to do is not to find out who's looking stuff up, but what they saw. And we want, simply want to know what is the content of the DNS and when was each, each observation taken. And so, you know, as you point out, it is almost like a DNA trace for a, a, a physical forensics officer, except this would be digital forensics. Um, and, you know, the reason it, it is that is because nothing happens on the internet without a DNS lookup. That's just, that is the convenient way that applications, including the web, find their servers. And that's how servers find other servers. It's just, it is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And so if you know what's in the DNS, then you can cross-correlate. Uh, and that's a big word, let me boil that down. If you know that a certain name uh, pointed at a certain address at a certain time, and you know that a crime was taking place at that time, uh, and you know that that domain name was involved in, in whatever crime took place at that time, um, then you can ask kind of the, the backward question. You can say, okay, I see this name that was in a crime pointed at that address at the time of the crime. What other names pointed at that address, uh, either at the same time or just before, just after, long term? Uh, and you may learn about other crimes by finding other names that use the same address because that address was a server dedicated to crime or maybe not dedicated, maybe it's a vulnerable server that is also doing crime even though its owner doesn't know. Um, but that's the kind of thing you can do if you have a complete record of what we in the DNS. And we would not have that complete record if I had attribution over which person made what lookup. And so that's the choice we had to make. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm using a very simple example here that are actually six different major classifications of what I call a pivot that is like that name to address to name pivot that I just uh, just explained. Um, and they are used by all of our customers in order to find out uh, what they can, not about who did the lookup, but who performed the service. Because mm -hmm. let, let's imagine that uh, you're a, I don't know, a chief financial officer somewhere, and you get some email that claims to be from your chief executive officer saying, uh, hey, look, uh, we're late on our payment to thus and so thing. I really need a wire transfer. I need you to send, you know, 50,000 euros to the following account number. Of course, the CFO ought to be uh, suspicious about that and should say, this is not how, how our company works. I'm not doing it. But sometimes they do. Sometimes they say, okay, you know, I, I don't want to get the CEO mad at me. It claims to be from him or her, so i got to do the wire transfer. And of course, that wire transfer is to some bank account that is um, sort of uh, on the dark side of the economy, and you just lost money, probably ir irrecoverably, depending on what kind of wire transfer it was. So how do you investigate that? How do you know who did it? How do you get attribution on that attacker? Mm -hmm. Well, the domain name that they used when they sent the email to the financial officer, or the domain name that was used in the email uh, as you, get, you gotta click here to verify our account number information, whatever. Uh, none that attack can't work without DNS. They're not gonna say, and here's the internet number you have to go to, because the CFO is gonna notice, hey, that's a number, that never happens. No, there, there is a name. And so by looking up every, the history of that name, everything it's ever pointed to, uh, where it was served, what else was served in those locations, what it has in common, you can take a single indicator, that's called an indication of compromise. You could take a single indicator and promote it to an asset cloud. In other words, here is the set of other indicators that is apparently owned or operated by the same set of people. And you know that by itself doesn't give you attribution. But if you have a whole cloud of indicators like that, you get to do two things. First, you can see how else those have been used Maybe there are other crimes that you'll discover are related, and maybe you do have attribution for some of those other crimes. 
maybe you, some of them have who is. I know who is tends not to get used. There's, nobody wants to be accountable on the internet, so everybody uses who is privacy. But you might get lucky. It's worth checking. Uh, but then the third thing you get is if you see them again, if they come back the next day, it's possible that you have an evolved homebrew digital defense system that includes this type of observation and uh, asset uh, cloud creation so that you can say, look, I got email again the next day from a completely different domain name that is served by a completely different set of, of, of infrastructure. Uh, but I can tell that it must be by the same person because they do share, uh, the, there's a trail of breadcrumbs that leads from what I saw yesterday to what I'm seeing now. And so I know to be more suspicious in the future of someone who has successfully attacked me in the past. And that, that's it. That's how you get attribution. It doesn't always mean that you know who they are. You just know that the, they, they performed more than one crime and they're performing one right now. I only recently started to think about the, the potential of DNS and uh, uh, apart from all the e exciting uh, applications and security that uh, you have uh, you have talked about so far, uh, the, you know, uh, there is also, I think, a very interesting aspects um, of uh, looking at um, internet and domain generation dynamics. Uh, and potentially predicting with this historical data some major events like mergers, acquisitions, and bankruptcies. Um, in your opinion, why uh, businesses do not realize this potential? Is because I mean, this is a gold mine. You know, if you if you can get um, information about you know uh, historical DNS, you can probably have a much better understanding of what what is going on with businesses, how our business ecosystems change in you know different countries or globally, and it just seems to me really underexplored uh, area. So, in your opinion, why why is that? Why no one thinks in that direction? Well, I think there is a blizzard of this kind of opportunity coming at every company mm -hmm. and that uh, they have an effectively infinite number of things they could study as opportunities to improve but a finite capacity for doing such study um, so it, it again this highlights the importance of knowing what's going on knowing enough about what's going on so that you can prioritize your finite resources in a, a world of infinite opportunity so, you know, we're starting to finally see uh, some, some uh, corporate governance rules where the exec team has to have uh, somebody like a chief information security officer. Uh, sometimes the board has to have not just maybe financial or risk management or insurance background, but there has to be somebody on the board who knows what cybersecurity is. Um, and as we see that play out, it's going to become possible for companies to figure out, all right, where in my grand scheme of uh, corporate defense do I do I put this? Is it below the bottom? I just don't have time. Is it at the top? Do I have to stop something I'm currently doing and, and put this in before I continue? Those are decisions that can only be made if you were informed. And sadly, a lot of companies just have not been. Uh, we may have to wait for uh, my kids' generation to grow up and take over the reins of the corporate world so that the people who grew up with this stuff uh, will finally be in a position to apply their knowledge. Because right now we're dealing with uh, people in my generation running all these companies, and most of us are singular in our skills. Uh, very, very few people, statistically speaking, know enough to make an informed decision about how to do digital defense. Um, and that, again, that, that leads toward this seduction where if somebody comes to you and says, I know you don't have the resources it takes to understand what's going on, so just write me a check. That's a resource you do have. You've got money. If you write the check to me, I will understand on your behalf. And sadly, that tends like the whisper from the dark side of the force in the Star Wars movies. It's a very seductive uh, um, promise. And uh, it does not lead to a good result. And you know, if, if you'll permit me, I'd like to explain something very simple about complexity. That <laughs> yes, go ahead. Should, 
uh, should be compelling to a broad audience. And that is that um, the reason that we are attacked successfully and the reason we lose our personal information, uh, my wife today told me that um, Microsoft Defender sent her, sent her a message saying that her personal information had been found out on the dark web. Okay, well, my wife is a sysadmin by trade. She, she, knows, she knows how to keep herself safe. Um, but, uh, you know, we have all of these things in our houses and uh, that we carry on our bodies that have millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of lines of program code. And uh, no one really understands even a, a large fraction of it. And if they did, then if you ask them, well, how do those things, I understand, okay, great, you understand a third of it, but how does that third interact with itself? What about the, the combination of complexity between different sources? Well, nobody, nobody really gets that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the reason we are successfully attacked is that our attacker knows more about our digital infrastructure than we do. And that's because that's all they have to know. That's what they study. That's their career. We have some other career besides understanding the complexity of our digital systems, but the, the bad guys don't. That's all they do because that's how they uh, that, that's how they get the money to, uh, to to pay for their groceries is by stealing our stuff. Um, and so that's an asymmetric cold war where one side is much better uh, resourced than the other. And, and motivated, much better motivated, right? They're also better motivated. So what I try to get people to understand is uh, to just treat this as a fraction. You know, if you could boil this down to numbers, maybe you, it's stupid to try, but if you, conceptually we can. Let's say that you've got 10 devices and you understand how seven of them work. I don't think that's realistic, but I'm just go with me for the purpose of an example. Maybe I understand how this coffee cup works. Um, so that would be one of my one of my 10. Um, then, you know, you understand 70% of what could hurt you, then that's good. Uh, the bad guy probably has a higher percentage than you do, as I've explained. But the bigger problem is that there are a lot of people out there who want to sell you number 11 and 12 and 13 will be right behind it. And this could be maybe a newer smartphone that has a better camera. This could be maybe a thermostat on the wall that you can access from your smartphone or that will, I don't know, help lower your energy costs. This could be a, maybe a refrigerator that can send you email if you're low on milk, whatever it is. There's a whole bunch of really interesting space age futuristic technology offered to us at all times. And you know the inclination, we are humans, the inclination is to say, hey, it's a shiny object. And I am a barely evolved monkey and I like shiny, shiny objects. So yeah, bring it on, I want that. But what that means is that your uh, fraction of understanding has gone down. You still only understand seven out of, however, seven out of 11 is a little less than seven out of 10. <laughs> and seven out of 12 is trending downward. So if we keep doing things that cause the fraction of what could, uh, of, uh, what could hurt us to go downward, and we don't simultaneously invest in greater understanding or in getting rid of older stuff so that it can no longer hurt us, then we are rolling out the red carpet and saying, hey, come steal my stuff. Because <laughs> under, the, the level of understanding is the primary indicator of vulnerability. And if I could just get people to think that way, both as individuals, you know, wondering what kind of refrigerator to buy, uh, I've been spammed, I've been DDoSed by refrigerators. So I'm telling you, they're bad. Don't buy one that works that way. And if it does, don't turn it on. Turn, you know, don't have a Wi-Fi that it can reach. Um, and, but that gets much worse in a corporate environment. A lot of people want to buy like a really nice firewall. It's got all kinds of advanced features. Well, let me tell you, uh, a dozen times a year, a firewall is found to have a vulnerability. In other words, by adding that particular kind of complexity, you're probably adding new ways that you can be attacked in addition to closing off the other ones that the firewall vendor knew about. So we've got to think about complexity as though it had mass and we can only carry a certain amount of it before it crushes us. Thank you for letting me intercede. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it kind of goes back to your point about um, 
uh, you know, people, yeah, uh, people, so sort of people do not spend enough time, you know, learning about risk and yeah. But I mean, I'm a, a little bit of an optimist in that regard. I think that everyone understands the value of information. Uh, we just, I think, need to reroute people towards the the right information that actually helps them rather than, you know, simple uh, low hanging fruit of information that they normally think is valuable. Um, I cannot uh, avoid the question, uh, question about COVID. So I actually saw uh, several uh, publications on Farsight Security website uh, about, you know, what trends like internet trends um, um, you know, during pandemic. So I just wanted to ask you, um, since you're observing the, you know, the change in, in activity, uh, during COVID, uh, what are what are these uh, main observations? How did our behavior change during COVID from you know from where you stand? Because you can observe, I guess, all these all these ecosystems. Well, what I can observe is the behavior of uh, people who make services available, uh, and I get a little bit of an indication of uh, popularity. But I and from that, I can often sort of make generalizations about how the population as a whole seems to be behaving. Mm -hmm. This thing will be more popular than something else. I'm going to guess that's because it got used uh, more and that may be good because it's better, more attractive or because it was better advertised. You know, so there's a lot that's going on there, but at no time do we ever get a sense that you, for example, might have looked up some name related to COVID because uh, mm -hmm. we just, we don't gather information that comes from end users. Um, but what we do see is that in every headline making event, so in America that's school shootings or uh, the shootings in Las Vegas, uh, we have a lot of guns and we don't have a lot of uh, care about uh, you know, what happens with those guns. And so every time there is another headline making mass shooting, mass, mass casualty event, um, it, it takes place somewhere. There will be the name of the town where it happened or the name of the hotel where it happened or the name of the school where it happened. And uh, within minutes, we see fake victim donation websites uh, that are being used. And for that to happen within minutes, you have to understand there has to, had to be somebody who was waiting, had nothing else to do that day except wait to see what erupted in the headlines. And they very quickly register a domain name, which takes, you know, five minutes by itself for, for a lot of domain names, although we keep making that faster, which mystifies me. Um, and then they had to spam. They had to send a lot of emails saying, hey, there's been a uh, mass shooting event. And, uh, you know, if you're concerned about that, you know, the Red Cross could use some help. You know, here we are pretending to be them or pretending to be some other, you know, uh, hospital or uh, doctors without borders, uh, physicians, sons, frontiers. Um, and, you know, the, if, if you wish to help, you know, here's a way. And um, just within minutes, you're going to see lookups for those names. And we, of course, we don't see everything. No one sees everything, but we see significantly more than half of all of the DNS pattern space. You know, so if a name exists, it's a better than even chance that we are seeing some of the lookups to it. And uh, without such lookups, we would never know it existed. So uh, it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. Um, but COVID is special. COVID is a mass casualty event. We've lost uh, close to 230,000 American lives. Um, but I know that other countries are also suffering and we're going through a second wave uh, in some of the European countries that had this kind of under control from the spring. But, you know, now we've got the flu, now we're getting cold weather, people are spending more time inside. So we're seeing just the world is losing a lot of people. And um, when that happens, people are very interested in it and they want to get information. They want to be told, should I wear a mask or not? And there's a huge amount of disinformation out there that is seeded by folks who say, uh, look, I want you to believe a certain thing because then you'll be uh, very interested in the political parties who believe that way. And so I'm going to try and convince you to like the things that my political party likes. So 
uh, or my preferred party. And then that disinformation becomes misinformation when someone like you or I sees it and says, oh, that's very important. I should repost that on, on uh, social media, even though it's effectively all lies. And so, you know, that's how disinformation that's deliberate lies becomes misinformation that is sort of accidental, ignorant lies. Um, and so many of those things refer to websites that are full of the bad information. And they all sound a little bit COVID-like. Maybe they've got a 19 in them. Maybe they've got NCOV, the novel coronavirus. But they'll have a whole, there's a whole sort of space of, of the pattern that looks a little bit COVID-y. And, um, you know, we don't do any machine learning here. We've got no magic. You know, when somebody says, I'm going to help you with predictive analytics and, and artificial intelligence, that means not only will you not understand what they're doing, they don't understand what they're doing. So uh, <laughs> you should always view those people with some suspicion. But I can tell you that without doing any magic, you can look for things that would sound the same if spoken or look the same if written as some basic set of keywords, and you do that. That's normal data processing, no magic, no deep learning, nothing like that. Uh, and we see this stuff, and we see it just a constant trickle, even today, of new COVID-related misinformation and disinformation sites. And maybe it's, uh, I wanna sell you a mask, and here you can buy 100 of them for a certain low price, and maybe you don't, you, you send the money and you don't get masks, or maybe you get masks, but they aren't the kind that were advertised or they're sort of uh, no longer suitable. They've been found that they no longer do the job, but somebody had a warehouse full of them. So now they're selling them this way. Um, it's uh, it's, a, it's a, just a gigantic number of different ways to scam interested potential victims of mass casualty events, such as a school shooting or, or COVID using the internet. And, uh, you know, we get to see that uh, and we see somewhere around five new domain names per second are bought by somebody who wants to register a domain name and about another 50 are created under those names like www.thenameyoubought.com or something like that. Uh, we see you know, around 50 to 100 new names every second. And so we're e easily able to keep up with that rate and see which one of these sounds like the current mass casualty event and uh, you know, how fast is that problem growing. And mm -hmm. because the way the internet has developed is very much a libertarian ideal where there is no central government, there are no laws, that means there tends to not be a way to get them taken down. So even if, even if I were aware of something that is causing harm, uh, all I can really do is send a request, hey, this is causing harm. Could you please remove this from your service? And maybe they will, and probably they won't. So um, it's, it's ugly. I'm seeing human nature at its ugliest through my window on the DNS, which is a window onto the internet. And uh, yeah, so the world also had uh, quite a few social engineering attacks, right? Um, uh, COVID related and... Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm also thinking, you know, because we at the Alan Turing Institute do quite a lot of work on COVID and uh, very often the challenge is good data. <laughs> I think, well, DNS is great data for that. I mean, yes, you, like you said, there are like you cannot observe everything, but, you know, you can you can observe enough, I guess, to understand uh, the changes in the ecosystem and what what is happening and what uh, what is being created and yeah potentially even you know identify this uh, these threats uh, quite early uh, yeah um, this is this is a question from my colleagues uh, <laughs> and um, everyone uh, I, I asked uh, uh, probably a dozen people um, working on cybersecurity and all of them want to know what what is the future of dns <laughs> they said well if you if you have to ask one i mean in in different ways they kind of ask the same question like what are, what are the future trends what will will we observe in dns in the next few years well i mentioned earlier that um corporations are uh, successful only to the extent that they can control their business conditions and improve those business conditions um, and I also want to remind everybody that a, unless you're a billionaire, 
a corporate person is going to be more powerful than you as a real person. So that'll tend to mean that corporations get the business conditions they want and the rest of us live with those. That's just, a, that's the way the power dynamic works. So the way this has been playing out in recent years is that um, the data that results from internet activities is starting to become more valuable than the internet activities themselves, not just by selling ads, but selling metrics that can help guide supply chains and, and so forth. It makes everything more efficient. Um, but that means that if you can't ride the efficiency wave near the front, you're probably going to lose out. Um, and it also means that uh, it is honestly true that if you're getting something for free on the internet, uh, then actually that's not the product. You are the product and your activities are the product. So you take all that together and you, you ask the question, all right, uh, most internet growth is on smartphones, cell phones. And uh, certainly that's what has pushed Apple to be such a large you know, trillion dollar plus company um, is uh, not people using laptops and desktop computers and whatnot. They are, they're using smartphones. Um, so traditionally, who has been getting the revenue from sort of uh, the data from, from cell phone use, whether it was the telephone companies. And um, of course the phone companies are now also the internet providers. So you're getting your uh, telephone data service from a phone company. You're getting your DSL link to your house from a phone company. Uh, and so the phone company doesn't really wanna just provide connectivity, they wanna have advanced services. They want to be in the music business and the movie business and the advertising business. They, they don't just want to be what's called a dumb pipe. They want to be a smart pipe adding value and they want their profitability to be really exciting the way it would be if they were a tech company. Um, so they're all making those investments. Um, and that in turn means they're trying to uh, avoid disintermediation. They don't want let's say Google with the Android or Apple with the iPhone to come along and uh, hide everything and make it all encrypted so the phone company can't see what it is. Um, and of course the internet companies want very much to do that, not because they are uh, worried that the data is gonna be seen by somebody that it shouldn't be seen by, but because they don't wanna share the profitability of that data. So there's kind of like a gang war between the phone companies and the big tech companies and we are standing on the sidewalk watching the gang war go by and occasionally uh, a bullet will come our way. Not that they were aiming for us, but it just we're, in the, we're, we're, we're nearby when the, when the gang war is happening. So the way that's playing out right now is something called DNS over HTTP. And that means that instead of DNS transactions being sort of clear text data that anyone along the path is capable of, of observing, and maybe you know using for building a profile or sending you ads or whatever it's being shrouded in encryption so no one along the path knows anything about it um and that is just that's part of the gang war that's uh gangster on gangster violence it has nothing to do with me except that uh i let's say doing parental controls through dns i might have something that says hey you know, I've got young kids. I don't want them looking at sites that are known to be bad. So I'm just going to fix the family DNS service so that those things don't work. Well, I can't do that anymore because the young kids are using modern devices whose makers don't want anyone on the path to see what those devices might do. And um, so again, they're not aiming at parental controls, but they are taking my ability to have parental controls or if I'm a corporation myself, maybe my chief information security officer wants to have controls like that. They want to keep people from surfing, you know, the certain websites uh, from their desk or whatever. That doesn't work anymore um, because of DNS over HTTP. And we're not the targets, right? They're much more worried about the telcos taking their ad revenue, or they're worried about nation state actors uh, like the NSA doing all the things that Edward Snowden told them that the NSA did. Um, and, and so they're, they're, they do have some understandable concerns, but the fact that they don't care about the collateral damage to all of us who have been monitoring our DNS and using DNS to filter 
things to defend our people and our employees and our family and our devices because we don't trust our devices um, anyway it's uh, we're just getting caught up in this so that's the future of the DNS is uh, more and more of it will be hidden from the people who have seen it or used it in the past uh, there's a proposal right now to have a website control its own DNS and so after a web browser has uh, reached a website using whatever DNS service the user uh, chose, all of the, res the, the subsequent DNS traffic goes straight to the web server, bypasses the DNS completely. And this has to do with ad optimization. They, they can count the number of uh, milliseconds, that's uh, one thousandth of a second. They can count how many milliseconds it took between when you clicked on something and uh, when the first photon of the, the next advertising impression reached your eyeball. And that time to impression is the primary metric by which people in the ad business get their bonuses. And so they're doing everything they can to cut that number down and they do not care what they do as a side effect of that to the ability of parents or CISOs or any of us indeed to uh, see what our own devices are, do are using DNS for so that we, owning those devices, might control what they can and cannot do. So they're changing what it means to own our devices. And we're sent to, we're, they should give us the devices. They should just say, hey, here's, a, here's a, an, an iPhone, I'll pay the thousand bucks, here it is, I just want you to use it because I'm gonna make way more than a thousand bucks by watching what you do, if only I can keep anyone but me from seeing, what, uh, seeing the same thing I do. Um, they, they shouldn't make me pay for something if I'm not going to be in control of it. If I don't own it, they should make a free gift, but they're not doing that. They're charging me for it, and then they're charging me again in my data. So I'm a little angry about that. But that's the future, is uh, more disintermediation. Mm -hmm. uh, DNS is just too sexy now. Awesome. Uh, so I want to uh, zoom out a little bit and uh, actually ask you about um, uh, the future of computer science as well. Um, what I, I seem to observe, I don't know whether you would agree, is uh, educational inflation so that we have, you know, we need PhD where we needed master's degree before and, uh, you know, in, um, back in the day when you know, when, when you started in computer science, I guess there were a bunch of enthusiasts. I mean, I, I don't know whether these guys even had, uh, you know, education in computer science or, you know, maybe they, some of them had education in engineering or something like that. And now we have, you know, all these programs, PhD programs, master's programs. So a lot of uh, people who listen to... to, to um, uh, to the series, they are either aspiring data scientists or they are in the process of uh, learning data science or in the process of getting into this. And I know you yourself kind of uh, have gone back to school and you, you got your PhD. So um, in your opinion, where is this all going? Do we, will we have something like something above PhD now? Or <laughs> will we have a mixture of people who are kind of not, not have, who do not have formal education in computer science and those who have training? So in your opinion, what, what, is, what is going to happen in the future? Some of that is cultural. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I have a lot of business and colleagues in Germany uh, and it's more common there for a manager to have a PhD than it would be here in California. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly I began my technology career by dropping out of high school uh, because there was nothing more they could teach me. And I had to get out there to where the work was happening so that I could continue to, to learn. And I later went back and got a master's degree in the, in the late 80s. And then I later went back and got a PhD uh, in 2010, finishing in 2010. It took longer than it should have. Um, but those were all afterthoughts, right? The, the opportunity came first, and I used to just kind of, uh, I'm sorry to use this word, but bullshit my way through interviews in order to get a job. Um, and if you could prove you could do the job, then some jobs would be open to you. Um, and I think that will continue. You know, Steve Jobs famously did, you know, dropped out of college and doesn't seem to have hurt his, his opportunities. Um, but what I'm starting to see is uh, the educational inflation you're talking about 
uh, is that <clears throat> we are seeing people staying in school until they have a PhD or doing it in, you know, as an intern or whatever, continuing education while they're working. Uh, and then I'm seeing them go back and say, all right, I've got uh, math covered. Now I need, you know, a, a, another degree in another, t another subject because somebody who only knows how computers work, but they don't know how history works or psychology or um, I forget about math and physics and so forth. Those things come naturally to somebody with a, a CS degree, but the humanities is what is going to make or break your career if you intend to create the next big thing. Um, if you intend to be able to speak to investors, then you're going to need an MBA on top of your PhD in computer science. Um, and so I'm, I'm starting to see people double up on, on the degree, um, but I'm usually seeing it happen late. Uh, so, I mean, what's happening right now is uh, if you know how to program in the common technologies of the day, which is JavaScript, things like that, um, you can get a job and yeah, they, they will check to see if you have education and, but if, if you can do the job, they're not going to not hire you because, because of that, they might offer you less money, but even that isn't going to work because somebody somewhere will offer you more. Um, and that I think is also going to continue. So I believe people are going to launch their careers before finishing their education and then go back and finish. Now, there is a second thing that happens there, and it has to do with getting older. Because when you're a little older and you have maybe kids or a mortgage payment or whatever, then you have sort of different freedoms. There are some jobs you can't take or some jobs you have to take, whatever. Um, but what I'm seeing that's uh, making me sad is the regrets. Um, mm -hmm. These people who are taking jobs at you know, one of the social media companies, for example, or one of the search companies, I'm not going to name any of them. Um, but I'll just say, you know, if they come to your college job fair and they talk to you for a few minutes and they want, they want to do a Zoom interview with you and then they offer you this job, uh, you're going to jump at it. And then you're going to work really hard and you're going to do everything they want plus some. You're going to over deliver uh, because it's so exciting and it's such an opportunity and that's all true. Um, but then it turns out that about 10 years later, you're going to quit in disgust and you're going to say, I am building something that uh, not even George Orwell could have imagined in his wor worst nightmares. And I hate it and I hate what I've done and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I want a job that is going to help uh, with human freedom and help with autonomy, let people behave unpredictably so that not everything they do is managed by some data scientist somewhere and their opportunities aren't managed for them in order to make maximize profit. And the trouble is when they quit in disgust, when they get those regrets and they say, I can't believe I've been a part of this, I've got to get out. Um, there's a dozen people waiting to take their spot. And those people will also get regrets after about 10 years, after they burn out, after they grow up a little, after they have kids of their own, and they start to realize that not everything that can be done should be done. And so what I'm worried about there is that the regrets will not ever happen soon enough to place any kind of limits on what these corporate persons will then do to influence human future. Yes, so absolutely. That's, that's mm -hmm. the uh, question you asked, but it's a concern I have. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I can see, uh, I can see it with my students. You know, oftentimes by the time they finish masters, they all have these shiny offers, and uh, they all say, "Oh, you know, I will come back to PhD eventually." And I'm thinking, well, that's probably not likely to happen. Like once you, <laughs> once you're there, you're there, <laughs> and you know, yeah. So um, it's, um, you know, I, I, I definitely. Um, uh, think that it's yeah it's it's you know it's very important to um, promote this kind of independent thought and uh, um, yeah imagination rather than just you know just kind of coding skills and so that's what we we try to do in, in um, you know in my classes anyway but I'm sure a lot of other professors do that so yeah definitely you know people need to think creat creatively and think outside the box about computer science problems. 
I have one final question for you, which is a traditional question I ask, and everyone complains about it. <laughs> but um, the question goes like this. Uh, if I asked you to recommend one book and one film, what would you pick? Mm. I can't imagine complaining about that, except uh, trying to well, find... Uh, everyone complains that, oh, you know, like I, I can name so many books and so many films. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> That's the usual uh, complaint that, you know, you, you only have to pick one. <laughs> uh, well, um, since the development of our uh, field, the technical field, is now driven so much by online learning, you know, watching YouTube videos or uh, online courseware or just reading the documentation or whatever, uh, I don't tend to read a lot of technical books. I have a bookshelf full of them that I refer to, but I haven't read them in 20, 25 years. Well, it doesn't have to be a technical book or data science book. It's something that you, you know, you, you read and something that inspires you. So it doesn't have to be a techie book. Yeah. Something you come back to. Well, there is um, there's a book that tries to get to the bottom of uh, the, the philosophic impact of quantum mechanics. Um, and of course, there's a lot been written uh, about quantum, uh, but it is the next big thing in the sense that, let's say, post-quantum crypto is going to be a big deal or uh, you know, quantum uh, key sharing. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting things that happen in quantum science that are going to get, they're going to come to where you and I live and change uh, what we do. And so it's, it's really worthwhile to understand some of what I call the woo-woo factor, where people want to talk about uh, whether uh, a, a quantum event only happens if a human is conscious of it. In other words, what does it mean to observe? Because there's a big role for the observer in quantum science. Uh, and a fascinating book on this topic is uh, titled, What is Real? With a question mark, what is real? Um, and it gets into sort of the parallels between when Einstein was first working pre-quantum and when the quantum people started making big waves and uh, when we started learning about the double slit and all kinds of things that challenge uh, our traditional uh, models of causality, uh, it turns out that logical positivism was also on the rise during the same decades mm -hmm. and very strongly influenced what we thought these experiments meant. Um, and it, uh, it's really been a bit of a distraction, in my opinion, because there, you know, it is irrefutably important, but there is not a woo-woo factor. There isn't some parapsychological interpretation that we must always keep in also keep in mind and that book what is real is the most complete and fair treatment of that issue and the role of positivism in early qm interpretations um, so I, I think if somebody was only going to take one recommendation from me it would be that book mm -hmm. what about the film what about a film <sighs> films i it's been such a long time since I've been to a movie theater. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be a recent one, you know, it can be something that you like. Um, I was, you know, a big fan of all the big movies that have come out in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that uh, for a long time, you know, Star Wars has certainly had a big impact. You know, the, that was the music we were listening to when I was getting ready to drop out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, John Williams. Um, and so I think I'm gonna, gonna pick a recent one that is um, off the beaten track, which is Rogue One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Avoiding Rogue One or the Han Solo movie or any of that because it wasn't part of the main sequence, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, Rogue One is probably the best movie that uh, has ever been made in the, in the Star Wars tradition, just in terms of the acting, the scripting, 
you know, keeping those special effects out of the way, but making sure everything was real realistic, you know, given that worldview. Uh, and great script as well. So yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Paul, and yeah, great recommendations. And uh, thank you so much for, for um, sharing your thoughts and your ideas with us. And I'm sure many of uh, people who, who listen to this series will uh, love it. Um, th thanks a lot for finding the time. It was such a treat to have you with us today. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for making the time for me to come join you. And I do want to remind your watchers, your listeners that uh, I love this. And uh, if you want to have, if you want to ask a question, feel free to reach out on social media. Um, I, I would love to hear back from people who've got questions or concerns or complaints even about what I've said. And again, thank you for making the time for us to do this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, for for you guys who, who are watching us today, well, keep, keep thinking and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.